I don't know how conscious it is on my part, but when I think about character, the, the way they present themselves to me very early on often has to do with the kind of work they do. Um, it's true that as a reader, I, I sometimes feel frustrated uh, with how little work people do in novels uh, or, or how, little, um, how little the question is addressed of where their money comes from. Uh, but, but in my case, it's not, yeah, it's not something that I've, uh, I've chosen to do. It's, it's more, as I say, a, a kind of unconscious impulse that um, when, you're talking about, when you're talking about adults, um, either the, the career that they choose or sometimes the career that they're more fated to, uh, to, uh, to go into says a great deal about them and about uh, their social relations uh, in, in the larger world, even, even within their family. So it seems, it seems very fundamental to me and, uh, uh, and I guess it is notable because other, other novels uh, don't make as much room for it as I do. Molly, uh, that's one of many things Molly doesn't do. I mean, I think she's partly defined by, uh, uh, by the things she refuses to, to take part in. Uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a Bartleby uh, figure in some, in some ways. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's important to who she is that, that she, um, not finding any of those definitions acceptable, she simply opts out of it and, and doesn't do anything, or at least tries not to, to, to do anything. Um, that's, that's one of the many negative qualities that she has that make her alluring to other people, in particular to men. Uh, she, she finds herself marginalized everywhere she goes, uh, beginning with the marginalization uh, where she's, she's pushed to the margins and ultimately pushed out of her own hometown. Uh, yeah, again, that's, um, uh, that's an important quality of hers, that, that she, she's, not, um, she's not comfortable in the center uh, of any um, any mainstream activity, uh, even what's mainstream within a certain cult, like being a student in, in Berkeley. Um, but again, even though uh, some other characters might be on the margin and therefore unnoticed, it, it's, it's Molly's marginal nature um, that, uh, that attracts men's notice. Yes, true, true. Uh, but the, the illusion that you try to create, obviously, uh, is, is of, the, uh, of the characters um, making, not only just making choices, but making choices that are true to who they are. Uh, I tell my, my writing students all the time, or I quote to them, uh, E.M. Forster, uh, who said, um, in trying to describe how, how a novel goes forward, um, that uh, uh, incident springs from character, and having emerged, it alters that character. So, the, because of who they are, the characters make a choice. The consequences of that choice slightly alter who they are. Uh, you know, so John is not the same John on the last page as he was on the first, uh, etc. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's of course, in the end, the author making all those choices, but, but, but the art of it is to, is to make the characters seem real enough that at a certain point it seems like the logic of the character is taking over. You're right. She's also she also creates desire. Uh, you know, less um, more more uh, unco not unconsciously, but uh, uh, involuntarily, she creates it and is interested in in, uh, in the effects of that. Um, but uh, but again, I I, th I think I would still say that uh, in uh, in her case, uh, the the effects that she's interested in are almost always um, uh, destructive. Uh, whereas in in the wider world, uh, it's more about creating uh, growth. Uh, well, let's see. I, I mean, I'd, I'd answer that in two ways. I mean, I, uh, yes, she is to, to some degree. I think she's a metaphor in that um, uh, her, her beauty uh, is considered, um, the, the value of it is considered negotiable. It's considered uh, to some degree for sale. Uh, it's something that people want to appropriate in the way that, that advertising appropriates uh, value from, uh, you know, from artwork, from celebrities, from, from the world around it. Uh, so in that sense, yes, but I'm, I'm always a little bit um, hesitant to say that any character is a metaphor for anything because, you know, you want them to be, you want them to seem like people first and only later, uh, perhaps like, like metaphors or, or like symbols. And I'm, I worry, even all these years after I, you know, wrote her, I, I worry that if, uh, if I made her too much of a metaphor, it would make her seem less than real. I do agree with that, and I also, I mean, I, um, 
uh, a writer I happen to particularly like uh, is uh, Alain Rogrier, who, uh, who said in one of his essays, as again I tell my students frequently, um, uh, that it's traditionally said of writers that so-and-so has something to say and he says it well, uh, and he says, might we not rather say that the true writer has nothing to say, he has only a way of speaking. Uh, I've, I've always liked that, that idea. Uh, but I do think, and, and another book I think of in this connection is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, where the lighthouse is obviously uh, a, a huge, powerful, multifaceted symbol, but if you read the book closely, before it is any of those things, it's an actual lighthouse. And, and to me, the, the progression, the, the progression through uh, verisimilitude to symbol or, or to metaphor uh, is, is very important. Um, and the novel doesn't want to, uh, you know, the expression, jump the gun. Uh, it doesn't want to jump the gun on that. When we were talking about, about the relationship between real life characters and, and fictional ones, and I, I think uh, often um, readers misunderstand that process and think that, uh, that we import real people, whether famous people or people from our own lives, into fiction, give them a fake name, and that's all the work we need to do. Uh, in the case of, of Toscani, who um, I think maybe a little less well-known figure now, but quite well-known at the time, uh, I, I went to hear him speak uh, about his work, in particular about the Benetton advertising, um, and uh, he was such uh, he was such a charismatic figure, and he was such a true believer in what he was doing, and he and he believed so strongly uh, that what he was doing represented the future, that you were just sort of drawn into his orbit, and you believed it too, at least for a little while, until maybe you got outside and had a cigarette and thought about it, and you realized no, that's that, <laughs> that's not it at all. But uh, but but the point was, he it just seemed like a perfect um, a perfect sort of character, and so knowing that, uh, rather than going to the library and learning everything I could about Oliviero Toscani, uh, I, I quite consciously did the opposite, which was to learn nothing else about him, because I think the more you learn about a figure like that, um, the more tied you are to the real and the, the harder time you have departing from the real. Uh, I thought that that one hour itself, the one hour plus what I knew from having seen those advertisements like everybody else in the world, that, that gave me what I needed uh, you know, to begin to develop a character. It was, the, it was not the... It was not the pattern for a character, but more like the seed. Um, so, so yeah, that uh, uh, he was that, that that one evening in his company was was important in the development of the book and and some of the uh, uh, some of the lines in the speech that Mal gives uh, are really drawn straight from that. It's, it's very true, and it's it's important uh, that that Mal uh, Mal doesn't create. He he, he in I think true uh, capitalist fashion. Uh, he, he, he causes things to be created, but, but, uh, but does not create himself. Um, but in fairness to him, he also, I think, uh, the speech is an anomaly for him. It's, it's uh, something that he doesn't often do. Uh, he stays in the background uh, as well. I, I think that's, that's his hope. He has... Uh, um, it was important to me, you know, in every aspect uh, of, of the book, in every aspect of Mal's character, that he be genuine, that he, be, that he really be what he says he is. He has no ulterior motive. He's not a cynic. He's not being ironic. He's not doing this in order to gain fame for himself, really, at all. I mean, he's a, he's a true believer. Uh, so, uh, so, so in that sense, uh, I, I think his, he, he's obviously a man with a large ego in a way that, you know, you need to be if you're going to... Um, uh, take out, you create the kind of institution he tries to create, but that doesn't mean he wants to be famous or wants to step in front of um, the, the things that he causes to be created. I do think that he has, to some degree, the sensibility of an artist, but but uh, uh, which is to say, both um, uh, the, the 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 stubborn conviction that he sees something that nobody else sees. Uh, and also, frankly, the you know the, the large ego. Um, so so he does possess something of, of um, an artist's personality, but uh, not obviously of an artist's gift. Uh, and and it's true. Yeah, it, it is sufficient. He he feels no need to create himself. Uh, he, he he does you know for him, um, not no not just knowing what he knows, but but knowing that he he has the power. Again, a bit like an artist, he has the power to take what's in his head, the thing that he sees that no one else sees, um, and make that real in the world. It's, it's not, not unlike an artist.
I'm a big fan of the series. Um, obviously, it's just it's portraying a world far different uh, uh, than than the world that uh, Mal and, and John find themselves working in. And, and and to me, that's a part of the series' appeal. Um, is uh, there's a, I think there's a kind of nostalgia that we all have for the days when we were still innocent about advertising and when it could speak to us uh, in in the simplest. Uh, really uns most unsophisticated way, uh, as if we were children, you know, again, the foundation of most uh, nostalgic feeling. So um, I, mean, I, think that's, I think that's a terrific series on, on every level, but in terms of the world in which and the time in which it's set, when I watch it, I think that, that what's comforting about it, at least for American audiences, uh, is, is the memory of a time when we weren't quite so, um, we didn't have quite such an ironic sophistication about the way the world of advertising spoke to us. I'd love to be able to say that it took me eight years to write uh, The Privileges, but um, uh, it's, it's not the case. I, I just, um, real life uh, intervened, uh, I, uh, eight years is Eight years is too long, but that's how long it happened to take this time. Their subject matter is the, the split or, or the schism uh, between a character's um, dreams and their doubts, or between their self-image and, and the way they actually um, move through the world. Yeah, that's where the, the really interesting psychological territory is. Uh, my first novel was called uh, The Lover of History, and, and it, was, uh, it, it took place in New York City um, during a fictional wartime. Not a war in New York City, but a remote war, much like the Gulf War, the Iraq War, uh, even though this was, this was years before that happened. Uh, my second was called The Liberty Campaign, and that was actually another novel about the world of advertising, although from a very different perspective. It was the story of uh, a man who was retiring uh, at uh, age 65 or 70 from a long career uh, in that world. So a much less modern, much less ironic world than the one uh, in, uh, in Palladio. And the third was called St. Famous, uh, and that was the story of um, uh, an aspiring writer who becomes, uh, he realizes his dreams of fame but for the wrong reasons, which is to say that he's uh, accidentally videotaped uh, being beaten during a riot uh, becomes a celebrity, but, but not on, on his own terms. In March in the, in the United States, I'll have a new novel out called A Thousand Pardons, uh, and that will be published in France by Plan as well. I don't know yet the date. Um, and that's uh, a novel about a, a woman who, uh, who has to go back to work, a mother has to go back to work relatively late in life because of a kind of uh, family disaster, and she um, she goes into the, the branch of public relations called crisis management. I don't know if, that, uh, if there's a French equivalent, but it's, uh, uh, it's when, a, when, a, when a famous person or, or a corporation um, does something terrible and has to have their public image rehabilitated, um, she becomes, uh, uh, she gets involved in this world and discovers that she has uh, a rare gift which other people soon learn to exploit for getting powerful men to apologize. That's her skill. It's almost almost like the skill a priest might have, but in her case it's in it's in the realm of, of public relations. Uh, I, I do. I mean I, I think we certainly still live in uh, in, in the era where there's um, a very large cultural industry devoted to to the man manufacture. Of illusions, um, I have to say the the, the French title um, I like quite a bit. It was not uh, it was not my idea, but uh, but when um, when my editor at Plan uh, suggested it, I, I thought it worked marvelously for the book. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I, I, I think novelists in general uh, in, in our time um, they speak in a kind of opposition. To, uh, to the, the broader, more familiar cultural narrative, uh, and they are engaged in, um, uh, in, in trying to establish a kind of counter-narrative. I mean, the, the uh, uh, Palladio, uh, to me, is, I hope, a, a counter-narrative to, uh, to, to the world 
of advertising, and in particular to the language of advertising, which, as you see in the novel, pervades the world of art, but also I think the story of the second half of the century, really, is in part the story of the incursion of that advertising language into other sorts of public discourse, not just art, but politics, obviously, and even increasingly into the private realm. So, yeah, our medium, really, as writers, is not simply language, but also character. So, yes, to try to find, to try to break these ideas the way a prism might break up light into these three different figures, Mal and Molly and John, that's what I was hoping for. Well, irony, and again, I could never say this as well as Kundera says it, the novel, certainly the European notion of the novel is founded on the notion of irony. And I feel like I can, there was a lot of talk in the United States after 9-11 in particular about how somehow irony was dead or outdated. It turned out, of course, to be untrue. But I feel like I can make the case for Mal that, uh, that irony is toxic, uh, it's morally corrosive, and it has to be uh, overcome, uh, but that doesn't mean I agree with him. Uh, you know, it's, it's obviously, if, um, uh, if you're going to, to write a, a book in which characters have different opinions, you need to be able to hold those opinions in your head without necessarily fe feeling faithful to them personally. I mean, I wanted that, that section the, that, um, that's narrated by, by John. Um, to be, uh, to be in the middle of the book, uh, it, it's, it's a moment where, with, with all the other um, uh, social voices, corporate voices, uh, ironic voices, uh, uh, detached voices going on in the book, there's that moment in the middle where the individual voice emerges. Um, I think fairly unironically, I mean, it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of genuine um, uh, emotion, genuine feeling he's in touch with, part of the reason I made it into a sort of diary. Uh, having emerged, it then disappears again. Uh, as, as, the, as the book concludes. So yeah, in, in, in that sense it is you're a, a book within a book. Uh, yes, that, that is part of it. I mean, there are a number of, of uh, factors really went into deciding to structure the book the way it is. Um, uh, for one, I just, I thought that, uh, I, I liked the idea of three different, not only three different sections, but in effect three different techniques uh, to reflect uh, in part, uh, you know, the three, the three pillars of the novel being Molly, John, and, and Mal, um, in part because they had, frankly, a kind of Palladian quality, uh, a kind of, you know, symmetry uh, to it, um, uh, the way that uh, we think of Palladian architecture being mostly about, about balance uh, in that way. Um, and, uh, I mean, I always think a lot about form with, with any book, and I think about it very, very early on. Uh, it's, it's, it's fundamental to me to try to find a form that uh, that both reflects and, and does justice to uh, the the content of, of, of the story that you're trying to tell. So in in the first case, uh, I you know I, I did like the idea that uh, when you have, uh, you have two storylines in that first part, one belonging to Molly, one belonging to John. Now I feel like any time you pick up a novel and it begins that way, you say to yourself they're going to meet. I mean, that seems like the inevitable. Uh, any reader is going to expect that, and in this case they're not wrong, but I wanted to make them a little wrong by having Molly and John meet, uh, by first of all by having the two timelines begin at different places and move at different speeds, and then having them meet I think a bit earlier than, than one was expecting and then, and then part again. Uh, I, uh, the, the, there were some of those techniques too, like I didn't think that was sustainable for the whole book. I didn't think that the technique in, in the third part where um, the sections are broken up by, by what are called messages, uh, some of which are advertised, all of which are from real life, but some are advertisements, some are song lyrics, um, snippets from, from newspapers, all that stuff. Um, I thought that worked better at the end than it would have throughout the whole book. So it gave me some, some room to play around, having the three, the three different acts in the book. You're absolutely right about um, uh, the, the, the cross currents, the relationship between past and present. Uh, in Palladio and how one, um, uh, have, the past is constantly making incursions uh, on the present. But as I say, different novels, different stories have different formal solutions. And so when I wrote The Privileges, which was about a very different set of people in a very different circumstance, 
Um, there, I was thinking about how to um, how to find a form that would do justice to, uh, to the sheer speed of the life these people had chosen, uh, and, and to the and to the um, the absence of reflection uh, that that kind of life um, generates. And, and so, in that book, actually, I was uh, one thing I wanted was for it to be as short as possible, even though it covers twenty something years. I never did get it as short as I wanted. But the other thing that I wanted uh, is no flashbacks. So in that in that novel there are none, uh, because the, because the characters themselves uh, would not be inclined to look back in that way. You know it's funny now that you point that out. I mean I think there's a uh, a couple of my books that have characters talking about fate. I think it's in the privileges too, uh, talking about fate in that way. And and I think that part of it um, there's also a, a similar, although obviously much greater. Um, passage about fate uh, at the very end of Madame Bovary, and um, I, I think f for any novelist, you have to you, you can't rely too much on the notion of fate because the reader is aware that there really is no fate in the novel. You, um, uh, the, the, the author is you know is making the decisions. The author is behind everything. So uh, there's something I, I know, unconsciously uh, novelistic about characters in my books uh, dismissing the idea of fate because. After all, they live in a novel, so <laughs> there's no fit for them, really. It's all me. It's definitely, well, advertising itself is, uh, is obviously about consumption, one of the ways in which um, traditional advertising works. Uh, now, I think, was trying to, um, to evolve beyond this, but uh, it works by manufacturing a particular fear and then offering you uh, the way to resolve that fear, which is always to buy a product, right? This is also the way politics works. <laughs> uh, you know, to the, the, the manufacture of a fear that you didn't know you had or that you didn't really know existed. Um, you know, I, my, my, my breath is terrible, that kind of thing. And, and then as soon as the fear is created, here's the way to make the fear go away. So um, uh, in, in, in that sense, yeah, very, very clearly about um, uh, and in other ways, too, very, very clearly about advertising as an instrument uh, of, uh, of the consumer society. Um, and sexual consumption, I, th I think the, the slight difference I would find there in terms of how Molly behaves is, uh, is that uh, her sexual uh, drive is almost always destructive. Uh, it's always, almost always negative or an expression of despair or an expression of, uh, of power, but, it, but in a negative way, the power of being able to blow something up. Uh, blowing up her relationship with John, blowing up her her, uh, her own you know childhood in some sense, um, so uh, not not quite the, uh, the the creative economic force uh, maybe that uh, but th that's seen uh, at work in the agency or in the, or in the the business world at large, but but related. It's maybe the other side of the coin maybe. Maybe it's a way of uh, of of. At least temporarily, um, restoring some of the power to the reader, uh, because I mean I, I can't tell you how many, uh, even while I've been here, uh, how many marvelous readings of this book I've had, uh, you know, from, from very smart readers like yourself. It's it's great for me to hear, but I, but I, I it also makes me feel successful in that um, I've I've given um, I've given the reader the. the everything that he or she needs in order to know what to think, but I haven't told them what to think. It's fundamental, I think, and, and I think to any good novel, really. I mean, I think any good novel that tells you what to think or, or that tells you uh, how to judge its own characters, at least before the final page, um, is, uh, it, it, it's dead uh, on the page. Um, I'm very conscious of, uh, of not only not judging my characters, but of making it difficult for the reader to do so. Um, Milan Kundra is a great writer on this on this subject uh, on the subject of uh, uh, the importance uh, of suspending moral judgment within the, the boundaries uh, of, of the novel itself. And again, it's not because uh, I don't have particular feelings about, uh, let's say, the world of advertising or, or, or the world of art, but but because um, the rightness or wrongness of those ideas is uh, is irrelevant. It's more of a priority to me to write an interesting book, and and a, a book that is constructed in such a way that it tells you uh, how to judge uh, what's going on in it and the people within it is just dull.